Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Writing for Screens, Ask Me Almost Anything. My name is Glenn Gers, and I come here to live stream Tuesday and Thursday, if I can make it, at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time Zone, Daylight Savings Time, by the way, to let you uh, ask me questions, talk about uh, topics in writing and screenwriting and indie filmmaking. Um, and the, the main things that I have to tell you are going to be found at any time, 24-7, available at your command on the first three playlists of my channel. They are called Screenwriting Essentials, Screenwriting Tools, Skills, and Craft, and the Process of Being a Writer. This is where I have taken a topic like genre, flashbacks, dramatic action, and I've tried to distill it down to a 10-minute video, a lesson with as many practical, simple skills and tools that I can show you uh, to try and give you uh, ways to approach writing so that you can figure out what your best way to do it is, because everyone has to figure out their own path and process. I am just telling you things that I learned in my 25-year career writing for TV and movies. On my way out of the business, I have decided to leave behind a little bit of this stuff that I had to figure out for myself, because it doesn't seem right that you have to figure it out for yourself when you can at least check it. Maybe my way won't work for you. Cool. Don't worry about it. At least you can say, well, that's something I don't want to do. That's all good. You should try and learn as many theories and, and ideas as possible, and then you figure out the ones that work for you at this moment. That comes sometimes can change. Okay, let's do some hellos. Hello, Donna. Hello, Najo. Donna, you made it at this time. Hello, Michael. Will you cover subplot? That's a good question. Let me write that down subplot. Let's think about that. Um, yes, yes, yes. Um, and hi, Jonathan, and hi, Thumper, and hi, Larry. Um, uh, good to see all of you. It is fabulous. Today's uh, first topic, the big topic, the main topic is going to be um, where do you get ideas from stories and what do you do with them when you have them? Um, and after that, I will take on subplot and anything else, uh, almost, that you guys ask me. <laughs> That'll be it. Um, hello, Nathan. Hello, Anthony. Good to see. Wow, everybody's here. This is great. Um, so let's just dig right in to the question about uh, ideas, which I'll just I, I, I've, I've gotten this one a lot. Um, just people say, where do you get ideas? How do you get ideas? Um, and, and I often think about the, there's a quote from David Mamet. Um, it was actually David Mamet talking about what he would like to say to interviews, I think. Uh, but he said, he said uh, an interviewer said, where do you get your ideas? And Mamet said, I think of them. And honestly, as, as smug and, and Mamet-like as that is, and I, I, I completely acknowledge Mamet is a truly problematic person lately. And frankly, since the 1970s, there's a problem, there's a difficult uh, offensive side to much of Mamet, but on the other hand, also a brilliant side. So I just try and, with all of these problematic artists and people, which we will run into for the rest of our lives, I think the best thing to do is take the good stuff and try to stay away from the bad stuff. In this case, this is great. I think of them because honestly, that is the answer. The answer is <laughs> you have to uh, not so much Think of them as look for them. They are all over the place. You will constantly be getting ideas. The thing is, you have to begin to think of yourself as a person who pays attention to those ideas, who writes them down and tries to use them. That's the key. The ideas, if you want to write, you already have ideas. Somewhere in your head, you've got an idea because you wouldn't want to write if you didn't have ideas. You want to write your ideas. Um, your idea may just be, um, I want to write a detective story, but that's an idea. Um, and, and yes, indeed, happy American Thanksgiving week uh, for those Americans here. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about that at the end when I say I'm not going to be here Thursday because it's American Thanksgiving. Um, anyway, so yes, the point about where you get ideas is I'm going to go through a lot of, of, of sources, but the real source is your brain recognizing the potential for a story in a thing in your world. 
That's where you get ideas. There is no other place that you can get ideas. <laughs> your, the place that your ideas come from is your brain <laughs> um, reacting to your world, which includes movies you watch, books you read, things that you like, uh, shows you watch, whatever it is. So let's just talk about it. Um, I think the first thing is that all creative work begins with what I'm going to call a spark. You could call it a hook. You could call it an inspiration. You could call it a, 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 a divine blast. I don't know. The point is, there's this thing, and you know it when you get it. And one of the ways that you get good at finding ideas is just start to pay attention to yourself and your reaction to things, because you will get this spark, this this idea. It's an element. It can be anything that hooks you into saying, ooh, I kind of want to do something with that. That may be all it is. It may, you may not know it's a story. You may just say, I want to do something with that. The, the key is you want to do it. You want to make it yours. You want to try and, and, and engage with it as an artist, as a creator. That is the first thing um, that every creative work begins with some spark. Now, what's really fascinating is that this spark does not have to be the center of the thing. It can be an offbeat part of it. That It can even be something that eventually gets thrown out of the finished work. That does happen. Sometimes you'll start, they'll go, oh, I want to do about this thing. And then by the time you're done working through it, you realize you don't need that thing. You've, you've developed something else that you love. Um, it does not have to be the most important or central thing. It's just the thing that hooks you. Um, and whatever that thing is, write it down. Whatever you think of as, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I might one day want to do something with that. Oh, that's kind of cool. Write it down. It does not matter what the spark is. Give it fuel and let it burn. Well, that's, that's, that's some language there, okay? Um, so the question is, what are these sparks? Where do they come from? It can be anything. Um, it can be a, a message, you know, a political message that you want to like. Upton Sinclair wrote a book called The Jungle about the meatpacking industry. His point was he wanted to show people how terrible the meatpacking industry was. Um, that's a political message. And he was like, OK, I'm going to build a work of art to convey this idea. Um, I once had, uh, when I was uh, 16 years old, I was working at a, a creative arts summer camp, and I got into a very interesting relationship with another kid there who was also creative, and he was competitive. And I, I am real. I, I can be really dense about competition. I don't notice it in other people because I don't, I don't like it. I don't feel it that much. And so sometimes, I, like I had this friend, and I didn't realize he was competitive until the shape of our friendships with other people began to get these weird dynamics. And after that summer, I wrote a long story about a relationship like that. Uh, it, it can just be that something that happens to you that you want to process. Um, hello, Blaine. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, Spark, once, once you start to look for them, you'll see them. Um, it could just be a, a time period. You say, I want to write something set in the Roman era. You know, I want to, during the Roman Empire, I want a genre. I want to write a, a, a love story. I want to write a, a mystery story. Um, famously, I've told this story before, Billy Wilder got the idea for one of his greatest movies, The Apartment, um, by watching, he was watching another movie, a movie called Brief Encounter by uh, Noel Coward and David Lean, which was the story of a love affair. And uh, a love affair that that, that is, is very subtle and, and uh takes a lot, they're working around to it. But eventually this couple who uh, meet uh, at a train station, because they're both on the same commuter train, and they decide to try and have an affair to sleep together. And so this the man is a doctor and he has a friend who's got a different shift at the hospital or something, so they can use that guy's apartment for the afternoon. And Billy Wilder's watching this movie. It's a great love story. It's fantastic. By the way, David Lean's Brief Encounter, written by Noel Coward. Um, and Billy Wilder said, What's, what, who is this guy who lends his apartment to people to sleep together? Um, and, and what if, who, like, I, I, what a schnook. That's, that was his phrase. 
Uh, and, and he did a whole movie based on this idea of like, what's the life like for some guy who gives people this his apartment to 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 have affairs in? Um, listening to a podcast for Larry helps focus on a story idea. Um, yeah, good. That's that's good. Um, sometimes what pops into the podcast, yes. Yep, 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 exactly. Um, famously, the Coen brothers, well, not, maybe not famously, I happen to read it in a book of interviews with the Coen brothers, um, they said that the movie Miller's Crossing, which is a, a 1930s gangster movie, um, which has a lot of stunning imagery, but there's this one image of a hat blowing in a forest uh, and men with overcoats, and this hat is blowing in the wind through the forest. And they said, that was it. It was like, who... Why? Why are these men in the forest? Whose hat was it? You know, what happened to them? Why is their hat blowing in the wind? And they slowly built up this 30s gangster movie. Um, likewise, they supposedly started um, uh, Inside Lewin Davis, uh, which is about a folk singer. And they, for some reason, they got the idea, the image of a famous folk singer, Dave Van Ronk, uh, who was sort of a more of a purist than Bob Dylan at the 1960s folk uh, uh explosion in the in Greenwich Village in New York um, and they said what if they had this image of Dave Van Ronk who's this sweet folk singer getting beaten up in an alley outside the club and they're like who would want to beat up Dave Van Ronk and why what happened and they slowly built up this story so those are the state they happen to have identified the sparks and the sparks are there's no way you could know from watching their work oh my god this whole movie came from that hat blowing in the forest in the wind. Um, sometimes, not always, sometimes just starting to write down the idea. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this is this is the most important thing that I often say. Write it down. Whatever it is, if you write it down, you begin to make it into something. Um, hey, hello, Magic Internet movie called Adams. Um <laughs> this, yes, this is a very good point. Um, is that true? Seven? I thought there were more. But but anyway, I thought there were 12. Um, but but anyway, yes, the whole point is when you put two notes together, it, it becomes something. Um, so um, you can get, and, and I believe you should, um, keep an eye out when you're watching the news. If you read the newspaper, the newspapers actually, or, or the, the internet equivalent, is a really good place. People's stories are told. They will say, this person had their car stolen in a car. Like I recently saw a live car chase here in Los Angeles. There, The police were chasing a person who had stolen a car. Um, he, he originally was just being chased by the police because they wanted to stop me, didn't want to stop. Then his car got wrecked, so he stole someone else's car. That car was a, a, a landscaping pickup truck that they had just bought like three weeks before, put all their life savings into this landscaping pickup truck. It's sort of like the Bicycle Thieves, an Italian uh, movie about a man who needs a job, but he can't get a job without a bicycle. Somebody steals his bicycle. Um, anyway, um, the point is that story could could move you to say like, what what if, what does that tell us about life? It could be an everyday experience you have or just things you see literally in your life Things people say, stories. Um, I, I will tell you some things that I, the, the, the ways that I got to stories I wrote. Um, another thing you can do is take a genre you like and twist it. Like uh, like you could say, I want to do a mystery story um, and, and you want to do something different with it. Or just work straight in the genre. No problem. Sometimes you can do something that you hate because you want to do it better. Like, man... I think horror movies are so dumb. I want to do a smarter horror movie. So you do that. Um, very often you can mix parts of things. You can say, I'm going to take a, a certain style of, of poetry and I'm going to put it into a, a, you know, a gangster movie. Um, whatever it is, mixing and matching parts of different arts, parts of different stories, those are all ways that you can come up with or develop your ideas. Um, uh, yeah, sometimes, exactly. Sometimes you need the words on the page to say, uh, you can say, okay, build off. Yeah, you guys are just ahead of me. I'm, I was going to talk about all this. 
Um, oh, seven unique notes. Okay, that explains it. Eight steps up, one down. Okay, I got it. Um, hey, Jay, good to see you. Um, yes, and I will get to that. Um, okay, okay, okay. Stephen King say something like writing down ideas is a good way to remember bad ideas. I I love Stephen King, but I have to disagree with a lot of things that Stephen King says because things that Stephen King says are right for Stephen King. <laughs> but everybody's different. And so to say like, you know, like he's famously like, don't use adverbs or don't write down your ideas, that's just nuts. Uh, it may work for him, but it may not work for you. Um, for me, writing down everything I can think of is a very useful thing. You'd be surprised what you grab and pick up later. Um, a lot of people will sit, have this theory, by the way. I've heard this one, and, and it just stuns me. They say, um, if an idea is good, you don't have to write it down because it will stick with you. This is biologically and scientifically not true. The quality of your memory has nothing to do with the quality of the thing remembered, okay? That is scientifically not true. The things that make you remember stuff are brain connections. And if you get distracted when you are thinking up the theory of relativity and then somebody, like there's a car crash, you could lose that memory and never get it back. And it's not that it wasn't a good idea. So, so this idea that you should not write things down because if they're good enough, they'll come back, that is... I, I, please don't do that. That is wrong, okay? I'm not a big one for saying things are wrong, but that is incorrect. Memory does not work from quality, <laughs> okay? Um, all right, so the, the answer is, um, uh, in my, being mosey sparks an idea. Yes, indeed. Um, I have never heard of See How They Run, stories built on other stories. Cool. Um, thank you, Morbo. Great. I'm glad you are here. Um, so I'm going to tell you some sparks for things that I wrote because, because I, I actually am sure I know them. Because the thing is, when you watch something, there is no way to know how it got to be the way it is. And it is a very, very foolish thing to believe that you can understand how someone got to the finished product by analyzing the finished product. It's a big, big problem of teaching the arts is someone will say, ah, because it ends with this and the theme is this, they must have had that theme at the beginning. That is not the way art works. It goes all sorts of different ways and you, you do not know for sure what is going to be the most important thing when you start or during the process. Um, I'm currently working on a novel, just started to, to go back to it, um, which was inspired by a paragraph in a biography of the painter Jackson Pollock. Um, it's a big biography of the painter Jackson Pollock, and it was talking about the moment in 1936 when the federal government set up a program to support artists by paying for their work. Uh, to hire, sometimes hiring them to do work for government uh, agencies, but sometimes simply saying their work is valuable, the government will um, pay for artists to work. This, uh, oh, got to ban somebody, hold on. Um, okay, so um, that image of, of somebody, they were describing how um, the uh, there were literally artists running down the streets of New York City to tell other artists the government is paying painters to paint. And I thought, what if you weren't a painter, but you, you knew, like everyone says abstract art, you know, oh, screw that. <laughs> anybody can do that. So if anybody could do that, they could get in this money. They could get this money during the Depression. And that was the beginning of a character who becomes the center of that story. The story has nothing to do with, uh, with any of that stuff later, but that was the spark of the story. Um, Hey, Chaz, good to see you. Um, D3, my first script draft was an idea based on games that I loved at the time and life experiences with things I enjoyed. Um, yes, exactly. You you never know. That, that's actually true. Like sometimes you take something like, like a game and something that happened in your family and you put them together. Um, much of creativity is taking things and, and joining them or mixing them in some unusual creative way. Um, you don't have to create every part of what you use. 
you you need to know that like if you take um, a certain storyline from this and a certain theme from that and a certain experience from your life and you put them together, you are creating, even if you are not creating every single piece of that. Um, uh, the, the movie uh, Off Season that I wrote, which Showtime made, um, which is about uh, Santa Claus on his summer vacation in a cheap hotel in Florida. And that was what happened. I, I don't know why I thought Santa Claus at a cheap hotel in Florida. Um, that's all I had. What I had to build out from that became so much more interesting about this kid um, who recognizes him and and why and, and the, this kid's um, tragic uh, life situation. It, it built up for it. But all that I started was like, how weird, like how funny, like what does Santa Claus do in July, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so that was that. Um, I have told the story. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, I have told the story uh, many times, but I will tell it again because it's relevant here. Uh, the movie Disfigured that I wrote, um, which is uh, about uh, two women, an anorexic woman and an obese woman who become friends. And, and uh, it's a difficult friendship, um, but, but a beautiful one. That actually started because I was walking on the beach early one morning in Venice, California. Um, my son was very young. He was just a toddler, and I would take him out to the beach early in the morning to give my wife a break um, from, from being with him, uh, watching, you know, taking care of him. Uh, and so I took my son out to the beach, and I was watching, and this obese couple walked by in, in sweats, and they were, they were doing a, a walk together. And I thought, wow, what a cool, romant a different romantic comedy to tell the story of, of these two people who everyone else um, in, in our society rejects for their, their body size, and yet they find uh, acceptance with each other. So I started to look into that, and I was thinking about it. And as I was looking into um, uh, the question of accepting body sizes, um, I, I knew about uh, fat acceptance groups. Uh, and I thought, what would happen if an anorexic went to a fat acceptance group because they saw themselves as fat? And so therefore they were trying to wrestle with, instead of, of trying to change it, accepting it as a way to deal with their anorexia. That woman was just an idea. It was just like, oh, that's, that's a, 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 it's a second spark, a spark within the spark. Because I had this romantic comedy and I thought, I thought oh, what a cool story just to explore this, this romance. Um, and then this, uh, I, I realized that the, the woman in this group, in this story, could um, uh, go to this group meeting and meet this anorexic woman. And that relationship, the friendship of those two women, became so much more interesting that that became the main story. And the romantic story became the subplot. Michael, you were looking at subplots. That's a sort of example. Um, so what I thought was going to be the main plot in The Spark became a subplot to the main story that I came as I worked on the story. Um, yeah, yeah, everyone's different. Paul Schrader is very um, theoretical um, and, <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and likes to start with a, a, a story concept. Um, and yeah, and, and, he, and he does it brilliantly when he does it. Um, ban Hammer, I got it. <laughs> uh, my first idea was a salacious rumor about a real-life actor who ended up being my muse. Muse is uh, a muse. Uh, yes, exactly. A muse is someone or something who inspires. Exactly. Um, if you were writing a new novel, would you outline all 56? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, abso I, I, don't, I can't write anything without outlining it because I just get, I get too... Um, confused and insecure, and also I will get like off on a tangent, and and it just will be clearly a tangent, and I and I don't want to throw it away because I went into it. So I personally need to outline. Stephen King doesn't; he roughly outlines. Um, uh, different strokes for different folks. I suffered a great deal trying to write without fully outlining, without really knowing what my story was, I found it very, very difficult. I found that writing got a lot easier for me when I outlined. That's why I recommend it to if you're having trouble writing. If you are not having trouble writing without an outline, don't outline. <laughs> you don't need to outline. 
outlining is what you do if, like me, you couldn't write without it. Um, I just found I, I wasn't confident in what choices to make unless I had a story that I knew that I could tell. So um, for me, that's why the outline thing happens. Um, uh, hi, Anjali. I don't do well productively when I write every impulse idea. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. See, to me, I've written a, uh, an overwhelming number of pages that don't go anywhere. And I, I think that's kind of the price of uh, doing business. That For me, um, I get too many ideas. On an average day, I will get an idea. If I don't write them down, I can't put them aside. That's what I do. I put them aside. Like when I write them down, I just sketch it out. Um, usually, you know, don't even spend half an hour. Just write it down as much as I can. And then I set it aside. That relieves it for me, takes it off of my brain. Um, it, that's that's my way to handle it. Everybody is different. Hello, Kamau. Kamau, very nice. This is a very personal problem. Curious if you have any advice for aspiring writers with neurodiversity. We're coming up for ideas is easy, but diverging way um, too much and getting lost in it. Ah, yes, I do. Um, my, my answer would be, first of all, um, and and I, I think that it would be a good idea. Take a look at, um, a, I, I've done a couple of videos that might help because a lot of this is about a process. If you have a reliable process, um, you can sometimes say, as much as I want to follow this thing, and um, admittedly, um, when you have, um, uh, it's, it's called different things, but a form of inertia, or once you start something, you can't stop. Um, that would require some form, and everyone's different. For some people, you need an outside person to interrupt. Um, for some people, you need uh, some kind of, of um, limits. I mean, you should work on figuring out what your triggers and patterns are for the inertia in which once you get started with something, you can't stop. Uh, for me, I find that um, doing an outline is a really helpful way to stick to the, uh, the path that you are on for one project. And if you get ideas that go other places, that's why I do what I do. I write them down. I jot them down just in a little note form, and, and I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, and, I, um, and I make just a pile. I just have a, it's like, just like you make a, make a room where you can put all of those ideas. And when you have spare time, you can work on them. But when you're working on one project, you want to be able to keep to it with the outline. That, for me, come out is how I handle that. Um, you, for you, it's going to be a mixture of creative solution and personal um, mechanics solution, and that's really true of everybody. Um, if you if you have a system, the way you can tell if the system is working. Is if it does if the if the result is coming out the way you want. Like if you find you're not able to finish projects because of X, Y, and Z, whatever you try, the thing that changes it so that you do finish projects is how you know that you've chosen the right thing. Um, Everybody is different. There is not a single right way to write. Um, it's very important to pay attention to how it feels. And whether or not you are getting the result in a, you'll, you'll know when things work. That's what was well, hard for me to believe. You'll know when you found a process that works for you because you'll feel a great sense of relief and progress. Um, it takes practice. Nothing is consistent. Nothing works all the time. But the more you practice the process that works for you, the better it will work. Um, okay, so uh, saying uh, you write pr productively, you get impulsive ideas, and you return to them. But his method of spending time letting recurring ideas process in my head for a few times, and um, you know, it's the ones I can develop. Angeli, if that works for you, that's great. I truly, truly feel if you, I can't do it that way. But if you can do what works for you, this is the most important thing that everyone has to face when they are being an artist. There is no rule. There is no proper way to do it. The proper way is the way that works 
for you. And by works, I mean you will feel good and get work done. Um, I have not seen After Sun. Um, absolutely. Uh, it sounds good. I have not seen it. I have, I have not seen anything in a while. Um, I've benefited greatly from writing down my own ideas. Yes, my ideas. Yes. Um, all of them don't go into the story, but it's better to have much, too much. That's how I work. Um, I completely agree. Um, uh, for me, that's that's useful. Um, Kamal says, I tend to find an idea easily, but can't pick a direction to go in because there are so many options to take the story. Um, and even when I know what I want to do with it. Okay, that's tricky because that is a mixture of being neurodivergent and the, it's a normal creative part. Uh, uh, and forgive me for using the word normal, I meant common. <laughs> um, uh, take a look at this video, Instinct. Um, the, the Instinct video, I talk about the fact that, and, and this may be different for neurodivergent people, but basically there is not a right or wrong answer to creative problems. So therefore, the answer is when there are so many options, to a certain extent, you need to follow the one that you in instinctively feel. Um, or if you can't instinctively feel it, literally choose randomly. It's better to make a choice than to be stalled. So therefore, if you have no feeling or if you don't trust your feelings, and you have no logic, because sometimes there's a logic of like, well, this will be more expensive and this will be less expensive. Cool, do the less expensive one. Or this is uh, you know, more like a famous thing, so I'll do that. All those are legitimate reasons to make choices. Choice making is the key to being an artist. Writing is making choices. So my answer would be, um, when you find yourself t going in too many directions, um, A, build an outline. Um, I talk about that in Why Outline. I've got a video called Why Outline. And please watch that. And then how to outline. Um, and also how to organize a project. Those are all um, related to the same process questions. In other words, in order to wrangle all your thoughts, you, you need a, a physical process. You need a, a place to put ideas and an order to put them in and a form to put them in. That really, really helps. Um, Michael, I think all stories are inspired by other stories too. That, that is absolutely right. Every story you think partly comes from the fact that you have seen other stories and the shapes of stories and the meanings of those stories have embedded themselves in your thoughts and, and become the form, the, the form that you like to tell in. Um, Outlines are interesting. I did a small outline of a script at one point. The novels can't outline. I have to let the scenes play out. Um, that's good. You know, whatever. If you're getting it done, that's great. Do keep notes of things that come to me for stories as I go. Notes, yes. Um, uh, for all of you, absolutely. The nacho, it's time with form lot. If you are having, a tr having problems with outlining and you're getting work done that you like, Great. The reason to outline is if you are finding that your work is is less coherent than you want. In other words, because you're not outlining, you're not thinking out your plan, therefore your story is going in directions that people can't follow. That's a reason to outline. Um, or it means you just have to do a bigger rewrite after. If, if the way that you can work is to say, I'm going to write whatever the hell I feel like, and then later I'm going to have to rewrite it to put together pieces that weren't together when I wrote it, cool. Whatever works for you is fine. Um, the reason I advise outlining is because for me, it's just too hard to do that kind of big rewrite. I, I begin to cling to things. Um, and also, um, for me, I just didn't know how to write. I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't write a scene if I didn't know what the action was, what the purpose was for the character. That's what solved all the problems for me, was starting to look at it as oh, this person in this moment has this need because they're trying to do this thing. Now I know what the scene is about. Um, if, you don't, if you don't run into that problem, if you're just like, oh, I know exactly what I want to write, write it. Don't worry about it. That's fine. Um, yes, come out. Absolutely. That, that's a really good question. It's very complex. Um, 
uh, for different people, for some people, um, it's it's being neurodivergent. For some people, it's being terribly, terribly unconfident, insecure, feeling every idea you have is bad, everything you write is bad. That in itself is something you have to learn to. Um, and I once again, I, I believe the answer to most of these problems artistically is practice. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I'm very glad you asked it too. Um, the main thing I would say is the more you practice and do your work and complete work and show it to people, the more you will be able to figure out what you need to do. Um, nobody learns how to do this art stuff all at once. It takes years, years to become a good artist. Um, hang on. Uh, okay. Uh, Morbo. I already have a rough idea of a story. I feel like I have not enough knowledge of the time and place it's set in. I'm thinking about a medieval. How would you handle this problem? Uh, no, that is not. It, it's it's slightly off topic, but it's heading towards the topic that I am. But I, I will answer it briefly right now, which is when you're dealing with the question of research, um, and I am working on a video that will be about uh, just about research. But here's the thing about research. Um, you need to research for your story. In other words, your story is not based in research. Your story is based in character and um, and the things that you want to say or the things that you feel. So therefore, you can write your story not knowing exactly how they get the water or how the manuscripts are written or, or who does what job in the monastery. The basic story, the, the relationships between people, the obstacles and the things that they are trying to overcome and the goals that they want and the, the, the story you can build without any research. Um, you will have to negotiate it with the reality of the time. For instance, if you have somebody like, you know, a woman who wants to run a monastery, you're going to have to figure out how she can do that, considering the reality that monasteries were only for men. Um, however, what I would say is work on the story and then research. Now, you don't have to wait till the story is done, but but build your story, build your outline. And then in the after time, if you spend an hour or two on your story, making figuring out your story, then spend an hour or two researching, um, uh, reading books, magazines, articles, whatever it is. And then what will happen is the research will be more productive because the idea is you'll say, ah, this idea that I just found about how they made the ink, that would go into this part of the story. Otherwise, you just have these random things that are all cool, some of which don't fit in the story at all, some of which may actually take the story out of whack. So therefore, I, I urge you when you're doing research to make it in the context of the story, because you're never going to research enough. You will have research for the rest of your life and never have enough, and you can't get it all in. Um, in, in my video, I talk about this. When you see them making a movie, right, and they're shooting on a street, and they have to research what clothes they wear and what cars they wear, what are the signs on the street like, that's uh, on a movie studio that it's all false fronts. Behind those sidewalks uh, and those people in costume, there's nothing there because they don't have to research what's the toilet like in the back of the building that they're walking past because you will never see it in this story. Now, it's good. Yes, ideally, it's good to know those things. But the most important thing you want to do is get the stuff that's actually in the scene to work. Um, you, given time, you will add layers and layers of research and you'll find all sorts of things. But the main thing is research in the context of the story. OK, uh, let's just move on. Uh, I miss writing my adult novel so much because I don't have pen. Make an outline. Um, <laughs> you know, whatever works. I am, you know, the, uh, there's plenty of writers who do not outline. I am not saying you have to. I'm saying if you are having trouble writing, try it. Um, some of the ideas I've had features have come from dreams I've had. Yes, we're going to get back to to use what if for uh, find answers for your ideas. Yes, these are all things I'm going to get to. Hold on. Um, 
Uh, hang on. Katie J. Hello, Katie J. I don't know that I've met you before. Let me uh, say, do you really feel like you know your character, like their inner psychological landscape? Once again, um, yes, I do. That's part of the outline for me. In other words, um, the, the, the story comes from the character, and the character is revealed and formed by the story. So they are totally built together. Um, for me, I need to understand the character, once again, in terms of the story. So that if, if I know the psychological landscape of this character, but it doesn't show up in the story, it doesn't help me. In fact, it can actually harm me. It can make it harder to write. Um, so what I try and do is think, I need to understand their psychology first in terms of what's happening in the story. And from there, I might build more. I might say, how did they become that way? What does it feel like? What words would they use? There's a lot of questions you can ask once you have your story started to get built. Um, which company had that guy who's just spelling public domain is with the same premise? Uh, that was actually a book I read. Uh, the t um, the title it was a movie company, uh, but the title was oh gosh, a naked is the best disguise. So a book about Sherlock Holmes actually. So that was not the, the that was just a guy explaining his job and how he did research. Um, but the the title of that book is Naked is the Best Disguise. Uh, it's from the nineteen seventies, I think. Um, I think stories are innate to human nature. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think stories are innate to, to human nature. I think uh, story structure is not. <laughs> uh, that's what I would say. Yes, we all know stories. Some of us have a stronger uh, mechanics of storytelling built in. Um, others don't. Um, but it doesn't matter because you learn story structure by consuming stories. The more stories you consume, the better you will get at building stories. Um, but I can tell you, like members of my family um, don't know how to start a story except from the very, very beginning. And so it just takes forever to get to the point. Um, you, you, we all can tell a story. We all understand stories. We do not all understand how to tell a story that will be productive for the, the listener. Um, okay. <sighs> Um, studying storytelling and art in general has helped me become more confident because I see that any choice I make in real time is correct and okay. That is right. The more you study stories, the more you consume stories. You don't even have to study them. I like studying them. I think it's good to study. Also, the more that you study how they were made because you can't tell how they were made. For, there's no way watching The Apartment that you would say, oh, this came from Brief Encounter. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so yes, the more that you study art and the making of art, the more that you gain confidence that you are making choices. There isn't a right answer. Thank you, Kyle. That is so nice. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Um, yes, storytelling. Absolutely. It is an oral tradition. Um, it gets more complicated as the form gets different. For instance, an orally told story or a novel by Dickens that's 900 pages long, you can't actually tell that Dickens story. Now, Dickens could stand on a stage and tell Christmas Carol, but, but even then, you get a certain point at which when you change forms, the mechanics of storytelling become a thing that you need to um, become conscious of. Um, but I completely agree. Storytelling and, and stories. We view human life as a story. There's actually an argument to be made that our life is not a story. It's just a random series of events. But we feel like life is a story. Our lives are a story, and therefore everybody's life is a story, and therefore all life is a story. So yes, human beings turn everything into stories. Um, I completely agree. Cool. Great. Thank you. Um, hello, Moons of Madness. I was doing research on a story I was working on. I had to force myself to stop. Yes, ra rabbit holes are, are a thing. I have worked on, like this, this uh, novel I'm writing about painters in the 1930s, I have to stop myself from studying the entire history of art, plus every, the biography of every single painter who was painting at that time. Yeah, you can, you can go too far. I'm having this problem where in thought and in planning my story, I feel chaotic and spring, although in hope in writing it feels better. Okay, once again, I would advise watching this video, Why Outline, and this video, 
how to outline, and this video, how to organize a project. Um, I believe that those at least make my argument for why if you build yourself a process which organizes in scenes and steps, you will help yourself with your chaotic and sporadic uh, doing it. Don't be afraid. It will not reduce your creativity. It actually expands it. Um, and it will not put all the creativity at the start. It doesn't. You keep creating all the way through. Um, researching neuroscience for a premise about AI and sapiens is what led me to getting an ADHD. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'd be surprised what you can learn when you follow your creative impulses. Um, and the thing about an ADHD diagnosis is it can help you in your writing process because, like for me, I work very fast and very hard, but then I burn out very soon. And I used to feel like there was something wrong with me. I would be like, oh my God, I'm getting two pages written in 10 minutes. I, therefore, if I just kept doing it, I would get 200 done. Um, but that's not how it works. I had to take a break. I, you know, so, okay. Um, Funny thing about screenwriting is I actually don't know anything about it when I'm writing until I finish the first draft. Yes, um, that's your process. Everyone has their own process. I personally have a hard time writing something knowing that I will have to throw out parts because they're, they're uh, later on I'm going to understand what it was about. Um, we do indeed create narrative out of events. Um, we feel better about ourselves, we fool ourselves into thinking it's right. Or it is a story, and we feel better when we understand the story. <laughs> so just that. Uh, just that there are different ways to look at it, Archmage. Um, yes, in a certain sense, um, we fool ourselves into giving ourselves meaning when, in fact, life is meaningless. Absolutely. I'm okay with that. I, if that's how we do Oh, my gosh, go away. Um, if that's how we do it, if that's how we get through life, cool. That's why I think we have stories. Um, yes, excellent, great. If index cards work for you, there are many people who do index cards. There's also index cards um, uh, software. Um, there's a there's a a thing a, a a writer friend of mine. Story blocks. Um, Writer friend of mine strongly recommends this thing. It's called Storyblocks. Um, it's a software program that that creates index cards and lets you uh, outline index cards, but you can work within them. Anyway, I want to check it out. I've never used it, but but this friend of mine, I, I respect him a lot, and he says that he uses all it for all of his stories, novels, and um, and screenplays. Uh, okay, just going to tell you a little bit more about me and some sparks, and then get onto a new topic about uh, ideas. Um, I wrote a, a novel called a, a screenplay called Fail, um, and and it was because I was reading the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe to my son. It was after he was a toddler; he was he was uh, like ten or eleven. And um, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, uh, in one of the later books, there is this character called Agrajag. Agrajag is this guy who keeps showing up in the course of the story and getting killed by Arthur Dent, the hero of of Hitchhiker's Guide. And this story, it's, it's a great bit in Hitchhiker's Guide, but I thought, how, what if you were getting killed and reincarnated in a romantic comedy? So what I did was I took this absolute stolen character, um, although he's not, in, in my story, he's not getting killed. There, there, she's He's not getting killed by anyone except the, the grinding machinery of fate. Um, but my point was I took this idea for a minor character in a massive set of novels, and I thought, what if that character was the lead in a romantic comedy? Um, and that became one of my favorite scripts that I've written. Um, so, so the question then is, so what I'm trying to say in all this is the sparks are all over the place. Uh, they very often will come when you are reading stories, um, either news stories or, or true stories, hearing stories, seeing stories in your life, or like me and Billy Wilder, you're watching something and some minor character or some bit in somebody else's story um, 
you just go, what if? And that's what Michael was saying, the what if. What if this guy who keeps getting reincarnated is trying to meet a girl? And I was like, I love that story. And I, I do love that story. Um, what if is a really is is the is the thing you you throw onto the spark to to make the fire. Um, so the important thing to remember about this is the spark. Uh, yeah, that one too. But the spark is a feeling. Okay, it's it's a a thing that occurs to you, and you feel, and you go. I am interested in that, or I see that as a funny idea or a scary idea or an idea that could become a story. So it's very important that you start to think of yourself as a person who makes stories and makes stories out of all this stuff. Someone who is collecting bits and pieces for their stories. You know, it, that's how you do it. Um, Uh, yeah, it's definitely not subsurfed. Yeah, um, I will look into that. Um, uh, I, I will I will try and find out. Um, thank you for thank you, Division Five. Um, I thought it was called Story Blocks. I will I will look into it and put the real information in the description of this video after this video is over. Um, I thought it was called Story Blocks. What do I know? Um, writer's Blocks, maybe I don't know. Um, anyway. Um, the thing is, you need to, like, like if you were a painter, you would start to look for images that you can work from, uh, colors, materials. You would, you would be always on the lookout. Um, <laughs> two, two things have to come together to ignite a spark. That's a very good point. Um, and, and very interesting and provocative when you start to think about all the possible things that can create a spark. Um, so the main thing is you need to start practicing the art of looking for story ideas. You have to start to say when you are watching the news or reading the newspaper or watching a movie to think, what would I do with that? Very often the spark is, I find this movie frustrating and bad, I would like to do a better version of the same thing. <laughs> okay, That's often the reason that you do something. You're like, oh man, that sucked, but it was such a good idea. I'm going to take that idea and transform it in such a way that it's not recognizable and do my version of it. Or, you know, they, they clearly followed the story in a bad direction. I'm going to take that basic premise, but follow it in the other direction, and that's going to be good. Those are all sparks. They are legitimate sparks. Um, one way that you can get uh, uh, practice collecting things is watch this video that I did called Brainstorming and Scrap Piles, um, especially the part about scrap piles, but also brainstorming. In other words, ideas, as Michael just said, they connect to each other and then they have meaning and then they are useful. Um, so that's really important. Um, I often find ideas when watching a movie where I think something's going to happen and it doesn't happen. I'm less thinking that would be a great idea. Exactly. Me too. All the time. Um, Blow Up, where the protagonist creates a story from an obscure thing. Yes. By the way, Blow Up, great movie. Um, great Marvel. It's an art film, but it's just, it's it's a, a um, I think it's a great movie. Um, very different from most movies happening now. Um, but, um, but let's get to the, the next step, which is um, I'm often asked, essentially, OK, if I've got an idea, what do I do with it? Um, somebody wrote, how do you develop or perhaps test a story idea before starting the process? Or do you start from story or character first? These are questions I have been. Ah, um, writer's blocks. OK, there you go. Writer's blocks. I apologize. Um, it was not. Uh, Hang on. Um, boom. 
Writer's box may be expensive. I have not looked at it. Like I said, I don't use it. A friend of mine um, has used it for decades. Um, okay, so um, sometimes when I'm an idea flow, I experience a slight pain when it's time to go to sleep. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and what's more, you know, maybe stay up the extra half hour and get some more of them. But the question, you know, everyone has to figure out their own life uh, the way that they do. But yes. Um, that creative flow uh, can't be beat, cannot be beat. Luckily, tomorrow is another day and it will come back. That's the thing. Once you've done it a lot, you know, I've been doing this for near on 50 years. And when you get a lot of experience, you begin to trust it will come back. I can stop now. It will come back. And it does. It really, really does. So talking about this idea of what do you do with your idea when you've got it to make it a story. Um, the first thing is this idea of like testing your idea or is my idea good enough? A lot of people say like I get ideas, but they go all over the place. The first thing is it's really important. There is no such thing as a bad idea. I will, I, I will stand on this hill. I will die on this hill. There is no such thing as a bad idea. So if you are letting the question, is this idea good enough? get in your way, don't worry about it. There is no such thing as a bad idea. The question is, is it good enough for you? And that's just a question of, do you have a better one? If you don't have a better one, do that one. If you do have a better one, take this one and put it aside in the scrap pile and you'll be fine. You don't have to lose anything in that process. There is no reason to uh, fear that your ideas are, are somehow going to stop you from succeeding. Your idea is just a thing you start from to do stuff with. What you do with the idea is what art is, and that that's where you have unlimited time to make it better. Um, yeah, poor execution, absolutely. Yes, it is entirely possible to take a good idea and mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> or miss the point of an idea. Um, not applicable to real life, all later writing. Absolutely true. This is this is 100% true. This is not legal advice. I am talking about writing. In writing, there are no bad ideas. In life, there are many bad ideas. <laughs> but uh, the main thing is, when you have an idea, please watch this video, use what you have. Start from where you are, whatever that idea is. If your idea is a character, then the question is, what do they do? If your idea is a theme, who's going to play out the story that leads to that theme? What, whatever you've got, you've got something, okay? Let's talk about the things that might be your spark. For instance, you could have a beginning or an ending or a genre or a plot twist. You could have a what if or a character. You could have an observation, a message, a problem, a topic, a feeling, a memory, all of these things are legitimate starting places. Um, there are no bad ideas, only shameful ones. Well, I don't judge. <laughs> I believe there are no shameful ideas. Uh, I believe there are shameful actions, but there are no shameful ideas. What, what you think in your head, you think in your head. Feeling shame for thoughts is a big, big mistake, in my opinion. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so glad. Um, uh, you know, there's a couple of ideas from back when I was a teenager that I still kind of wish I had. Um, the, the novel I'm working on, I have been working on for 30 years. So, you know, uh, I'm not maybe a great example on that. Um, my point here is whatever of these things that you've got, the thing you want to do is ask questions. That is what you do to develop your idea. Um, the, that video, process of questions, talk about it. But you start, you, if all you have is, I want to make a movie that's like XYZ, then that's what you start with. Whatever it is that you start with, do you have an ending? How do you get to the ending? Who is going to go through that experience? If you have a beginning, what's your ending? If you have a character, what happens to them? What do they want? Why can't they get it? Ask 
questions. As you may know, there are certainly certain questions that I particularly like. Uh, you'll find that these six, who is it about? What do they want? Why can't they get it? What do they do about it? Why doesn't that work? And how does that end? These questions, they generally help with everything, especially Katie's question earlier about character. That's how I understand a character. What do they want? Why can't they get it? What do they do about it? And how does it end? That's what starts the definition of a character and a story for me. Um, and so, yes, I did a video about that. It is called The Six Essential Questions. I urge you to watch that. Hi, Butte. I'm on my way out soon, but I'm very glad you are here. Uh, happens to the best of us. It is impossible to always be everywhere you want to be. Um, the question is, when you have an idea, what do you do? Ask questions. Fill out the missing parts. Because here's the thing. Um, no matter what you, where you start, you are going to have to get the things. You are going to have to get a story, a character, a theme. You're going to have to get a beginning, a middle, and end. You're going to have to get some conflict. You're going to have to get some scenes. So just start and fill in the place. Sooner or later, you'll get them all. By the time you've finished your story, you will get them all. Don't be afraid that you're not starting in the right place. You can start at any position on the map. And slowly but surely, you will fill in the rest of the map as you write your story, as you figure out what your story's about, as you figure out what's happening. You will have to ask these questions. So that's my answer is, do not fear your idea is wrong in the sense that it's like not the right way to start. Any idea, any feeling is a fine place to start. And then what you want to do is you want to ask questions, look at what's missing to make your story satisfying to you as an audience to say, well, I, you know, I want if, if you start with the beginning, you are going to want the ending. <laughs> OK, it's, it's going to happen to you naturally if you just start asking questions from where you are. That is how you develop a story. Thank you, Kamal. I'm very glad. Yeah, <laughs> I do indeed. Let us talk about, okay, um, I don't actually have any, the, the entire, uh, uh, I've got 250 hours <laughs> of this. Okay, uh, Magic Internet Cafe. Um, if you want to watch me go through this, press, uh, this process, there is a whole uh, uh, playlist called the Step by Step Project, uh, in which I actually let you, I, show up every afternoon and I worked from literally all I had was two or three sentences and I built that into a uh, pilot hour-long pilot script. I had nothing. I, I you can watch me ask those questions and build the outline and then build the rough draft from the outline. So yes, uh, it's the step by step project here let me this seems right. Okay, boom. Uh, da, da, da. The screenwriting step by step project. Uh, it's a playlist on my channel. That is where you want to go to watch this process in action. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, subplots, uh, Michael. I owe you subplots. I have. I will. I will do one on subplots. Um, the main thing I would say about subplots, just right now, that I can tell you, um, if you watch this um, building character arcs video, is it actually about subplots, um, or, or what you call B stories or anything? And the point about all subplots is they are all the A story of that character. Nobody knows they're in a subplot. <laughs> OK, so therefore, um, the answer on subplots is in this building character arcs. Um, please watch that video. That is it. <sighs> maybe a two parter, you know, maybe 
Um, absolutely. I will, I will come back to this, uh, maybe next week. Um, Neil Gaiman suggests taking inducing characters and making their needs oppose each other. Uh, that's absolutely a good place to start. Not every story will work that way, but certainly many stories do. Um, hi, BD. Very nice to meet you. Um, and hello, Delise. Would you consider doing a viewing on outlining for screen versus outlining a novel? I will consider that. I don't. Um, I don't. I, I don't feel like I am expert enough at outlining a novel. The other thing is, and I, mean, I can tell you this because I am currently outlining a novel, um, and maybe I'll just do some some live streams where I let you watch me do that. Um, but it's this exact same process. The the thing that the thing that actually this took me like. 25 years to feel the confidence of this. The things that I am talking about, about screenwriting, I used to think, oh, that doesn't work for a novel. Honestly, almost every single thing that I am talking about works fine for a novel. Um, even the, the, the prose writing. The truth is, there is not a particular writing style for novels. And therefore, um, whatever style you were working out for your novel it's legit. Once I realized that, so when I freed up and I thought, I don't have to worry so much about getting the style right. I, I do believe anybody who is stopping themselves from writing because they feel like they're not getting it right, they are probably causing their own problem because there is no getting it right. There's getting it the way you're getting it. And getting it the way you're getting it may be right. <laughs> okay. Um, Will you be doing what this other person did or what this successful person did? No, because you are not them. <laughs> okay, you are going to be doing what they what they did, which is doing what you do. They did what they did. You do what you do. That's how it works. So the 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 thing about novels is that there is no particular formula of of the the three act paradigm. Um, that's that's it. Dealing with chapters is really not that different from dealing with scenes. I mean, essentially, um, a chapter is kind of an episode, <laughs> you know. In other words, um, that like if you've got a chapter, the chapter has a beginning, middle, and end. The chapter could be very short, could be very long. Um, you could have many chapters. Like for some people, um, every chapter will just be one scene. Um, for others, three or four scenes make a chapter. But but within that sub um, subcategory or substructure, um, it's exactly the same thing. To say in this chapter, in this section of the story, I want this love affair to start. Cool. Now that may take five scenes, or it may take one scene. Um, that's what that chapter is going to be. That's still the same outlining. It's just you know you just break, I put a chapter break. I, you know that's that's. It's not that big a deal. There is not a right or wrong outlining form or even story form for a novel. Um, as Brian Brown, yeah, or um, or uh, the guy who wrote um, All the Light We Cannot See, which is brilliant, Anthony Doerr, D-O-E-R-R. -R. Um, All the Light We Cannot See, very short chapters. Um, sometimes they have multiple scenes, um, but absolutely true. Yeah, James. Ba yeah, yeah. Clive Cussler too. There's there are people whose process involves getting a hooky idea and selling it. Okay, listen. Um, this has been great. Um, for those of you in the, the United States, please have yourself a fabulous Thanksgiving. I will be off on Thanksgiving for Thanksgiving purposes, but I will be back next Tuesday and uh, pretty much every Tuesday and Thursday uh, if I can make it at one o'clock, and we will. Take up some more stuff there and maybe come back. We'll do maybe some subplot stuff. I don't know what I'm doing yet. It's a long time away. I still got to get through the, the weekend. Okay, go write something.